folks. Good to see you all and welcome, welcome. Uh, another live commentary. This time on a Friday night, so we're feeling kind of festive. I forgot to get my glass of wine, Michael. Uh, you're, you'll, you'll do tea, of course, it's Saturday morning where you are. Right. But uh, good to see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. We can always pre pretend this is sake or something. Japanese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's actually water, but yeah. <laughs> sake, water, you know. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, welcome, folks. We are uh, going to be talking about Game 53 uh, in the AlphaGo AlphaGo series, which means we're we're closing in. Uh, we'll be wrapping this uh, series up. Yeah, so, getting close to the end of it. Yes. Getting close to the end. Mm -hmm. All right. Before we dive into the game, a couple of things. Uh, how are you? I know Japan had uh, sort of done a big shutdown around the mm -hmm. latest uh, COVID variant. Um, how's that working out and how are you doing? Oh, well, yeah, um, big shutdown on international travel, mm. kind of a panic response to um, all of the new Omicron um, cases. Um, but they are admitting Japanese nationals, so it, uh -huh. it doesn't seem to be working really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> surprise, <laughs> because, surprise. Yeah. Right, yeah. So I think that um, like we have we have increasing numbers um, of cases that are Omicron. So it, it doesn't seem to be working. Um, but we just have to hope that it's not going to be. It doesn't seem to be that lethal of variant anyway. So from right. what we know. So right. I guess not, not being a scientist or a doctor. Or anything. Yeah, no, that's all I can get. Get everybody get your vaccines, get your boosters. I know I haven't gotten my booster yet. So uh, mm -hmm. that, that's definitely the way to go. I'm hearing in Japan, they're just talking about boosters right now. Okay. So I think it's on the way. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in, in the States, we're just hearing way too many cases of people that are getting sick and dying and they haven't gotten their, their shots. So if you haven't gotten mm -hmm. your shots yet, folks, let's, let's get to it. We don't want to, we don't want to lose anybody. All right. Uh, Michael, love the artwork behind you. Uh, I think there's a special angle to that, isn't there? Yeah, this is the calendar. I, um, so the calendar, you might see a, a little go board. I see right it. Yeah. My, yeah, yeah, right here under my elbow. Um, and there's actually two cranes. So, so if I lean over here, you can see. There that. we go. Uh, they're playing go. Um, not quite the crane and the, I think it was some other type of bird who was um, representing black and white in the old story. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, it was just um, with this um, painting. That, that's what the artist, who is my daughter, uh, decided to go with. And so it's a calendar that we're putting out that has pictures like this for each month. And they're all, they're generally having something to do with, um, with Go. Mm -hmm. And they also try to um, give an idea of the the um, season of, of the month. So like there's some, um, there's a, a tiger for the New Year's because it's the, the year of the tiger next year and stuff like ah, that. Okay. So we're um, putting out a 2022 calendar and hopefully there's going to be a link somewhere for people to, to click on. Eva D will put that link in the chat for everybody and get right on that. A, it's getting to the end of the year. So it's calendar time. And B, I happen to know that they're going fast and there is a limited supply. And uh, the last thing is that I understand you're autographing them personally. Um, I have already autographed all of the calendars personally. Wow. So they wow. all have my autograph in them. How's your um, hand? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I worked on it. <laughs> yeah. And we still have some left, yes. So there's... Um, Still time to get more. All right, get yeah. those. Uh, get those because you gotta gotta know what's coming up in 2022. So excellent. Well, good. Check those out. It's very cool. It's uh, good to see you uh, branching out into uh, what I believe we call merch in the business. <laughs> ah, yes, that's what they say. <laughs> and this was special because it was to celebrate my um, hitting 10,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel. That is so cool. Well, that that was what um, spurred me to. Um, get this idea well not to not to be a predictor or anything but you better start making plans for the 20,000 what you're going to do for 20,000 because I that's what's going to happen in 2022 I, I have confidence okay okay all right uh, uh just a reminder folks we are live so you can pose your questions or comments in the chat I'll try and keep an eye on those uh, Eva D will also flag them for me in case I miss any. Uh, we love to uh, talk with you and, and get your, your feedback and comments uh, as well since we are live. So be uh, feel free to do that. All right, what's the, um, 
I had a, I had a couple of easy streams, you know, with the with the you know the classic game and then some mm-hmm. regular games. But I'm uh, gonna have to work tonight, aren't I? Um, well, yeah. Um, AlphaGo is black. Um, you'd wonder what someone fed it because it's it's not doing what I would call the right things. Okay. And it's acting a bit strangely, and so it it sort of comes together suddenly. Um, it, it's just it's sort of weird and amazing the way it works. <laughs> and so it, um, it turns out it, it was um, functioning fairly well after all. So I, I was a bit worried about black in particular. We're going to call this game the weird and amazing. I like that. Yeah. All right. So let's start. Let's jump into it. Okay, so white is playing three, four points. This sort of reminds me of some recent games played by Iyama in the mm-hmm. international tournaments. I've been covering the Nanxing Cup, in which um, he actually beat four players in a row. Yes. Um, and that's the first time, I believe, for Japan. Like, there's some Chinese players who have um, had winning streaks in this tournament. Um, but in general, Japan did not have such large... I think maybe one person before, I think it was Yoda or something, many years ago when he won the tournament or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, so... Um, Japan being ahead in this tournament is, is it's a bit unique. It's a new thing. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's exciting in that way. And his games were really pretty impressive. Um, and I'm actually thinking of doing a, um, a live stream for his fourth game against Shin Minjun, um, who is, I guess you would call him the second strongest player in Korea. He's, he's a star player. He could, um, he's capable of winning international tournaments so he's um, let's do that i would i would um, love because um my um john power sent a report and was all excited uh, for the mm-hmm. same thing you know that Japan yeah, actually is... i was about i was probably gonna do it um this week on my own channel yeah uh, okay <laughs> but yeah, all right yeah it'll work that way also yeah great so check out michael's channel and uh i'll, I'll be there with you watching <laughs> and the reason i sort of digressed here is because uh, Iyama was playing three, four points, and in one game he played a, a three, three point as his second move with white. Uh, three of the four games he had white, so he was playing a lot of three, four points, and he played three, four points with black also. Mm-hmm. And this is relatively unusual nowadays, uh, when a lot of people are basing their openings on star points alone, um, just because of influence of um, of AIs, you might say, um, of the neural networks, they tend to prefer star points and people tend to work with that. And it's a bit more work to, to build a Fuseki from three, four points um, when you're using the AIs because you have to sort of force them into it. Right. So, so seeing um, AlphaGo doing this sort of reminded me of that and how this, this is the type of opening that Yama seems to like to start with, or at least in recent times, he's doing a lot of that. So this Joseki, it's pretty much um, nowadays, it's the only one that you see people playing. And it's the one that all computer programs that use neural networks like. So for instance, um, before we had AlphaGo, before, um, it's a long time ago, I guess it's something like 10 years though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, then people would be thinking of playing a pincer or something, right? So a pincer like, like this or a pincer like this. Let's get rid of that sound, I suppose. Um, would be pretty common, but uh, nowadays it's just, and it's, it's hard to say which is better. It's just that it's, I think it's relatively easy for um, novice players to understand this because White is immediately establishing um, a real profit from having the advantage of playing first in that corner. So it's very mm-hmm. clear how having the first stone in that corner is working for White. And so it's a Joseki actually that I recommend to beginners, like the first Joseki, if you play three, four points, this is the first Joseki you want to play. I mean, to learn how to play. Mm-hmm. Because it ends, although AlphaGo doesn't play the Joseki here, um, it ends in one more move. And so Black's going to play some kind of extension usually. And it's a relatively short Joseki. So it's just these, um, this eight move sequence in all, which makes it relatively easy. And the meaning of the moves is relatively easy for me to explain. So I actually did a video about that on my channel. I think I called it um, a first Joseki to learn or something like that. Mm. And white answers here. Um, White could have played a pincer, um, but of course you might expect black to play the pressing move here, which is supposed to be good for black nowadays. So white answered. 
and black played here. So this is this is the first point where black is being sort of. When I look at it, I think black is being a bit prov provocative. And so, playing one more line this way would be a better balance, and it would um, do a better job of stopping white from invading the right side um, on this side. So when black plays on this side, black is sort of inviting white in and challenging white to a fight on the left side of the board. So if black had played here, white would not do that. And probably um, nowadays, white would just jump into three, three point. <clears throat> AlphaGo zero does that. So maybe AlphaGo zero would do that now, um, or it sometimes played different moves. But the point is that later on in the game, let's just uh, take this forward a little bit. Um, imagine, ah, uh, sorry. That was a quick miss. Imagine something like this happens in black plays here. When black plays here and white does stuff like this, for instance, um, so something like this might happen, um, you still have a, a small hole here. Mm. And this is a kind of a position where you would wish that that black stone at one was one, one line closer to the, to the black stones in the lower left um, at the mark point. So when black has to answer at 11 or um, again, another way white could do it would be to play that move um, here. That This would be another way it could happen. When this happens, sometimes you wish that black stone at one was one line lower down on the board. Mm -hmm. And so basically that's what AlphaGo is doing here with black. Um, when he plays, when it plays here, um, it's making a big thing of the next move here, which will work well with this stone. So when black plays the mark point at h17, having this black stone closer, it will make the entire attack more, more effective. Um, however, white continues. So even if we say white is, uh, let's just do that variation once more. Even if we say white is just going to avoid getting attacked and does something like this, this is also a case where um, Having, in this case, that stone being further away would leave a little gap there. And so it's okay for black to have it like this. Hmm. And so I think that's what's happening. I'm, I think that it's kind of a threat to go at eight and forcing white to heat up the game here locally. And so, yeah, I jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah, so let's get back to the position there. So white immediately invaded. So that's what white did. So when white does that, that's supposedly forestalling black H17 or at least making it less effective. Just a question on timing. I, I actually I got on the board with uh, Phil Strauss. I uh, hadn't played in a while. I was at uh, Philadelphia last weekend. And, and so I was really trying to figure out when you, you know, when you have something like that, you know, do you jump in? Do you wait? What, what, what kind of things would you be thinking about in terms of timing? That's a really difficult question. Um, so like I... Um, first of all, what I just explained right now, it, it, and the idea of seeing what Black's threat is, what Black is wanting to do next, um, takes you one step forward in making your plans. Right. So uh, the way White played it in the game, invading here, is heating up the left side. And it didn't actually take away the option of playing H17, but it made it less effective. And you're going to see how it's going to create a, hmm. um, let's just show you. Let's just show you the game variation where black does do that. And you can see white stones are sort of naturally linking up and everything hmm. is working together with that invasion that white did on the left side. And so by playing there first, white is gain, has the extra local stone, which allows white to make this loosely connected shape, which is working. All of these stones are working in concert with each other. That's what I meant when I was saying that it, what Black was doing, it didn't seem to make sense because this is sort of working according to plan for White. It's, it's mm. a very natural sequence for White to be connecting up like this. So that would be one way to handle the threat. Um, or if you want to have a relatively calm opening, the other way would be to say, um, if Black wants to play there, I'm going to play something on this side, uh, on this side to stop black from doing that effectively. So that would be, for instance, it would be moves like this on the side mm -hmm. and like an old fashioned way, uh, you might say, or before AIs, this is the way that we would handle that threat. We would just build a position on the side 
um, which made it not so good for black. This would just be very cramped for black, whether white plays here, or maybe maybe this would be more, more effective. But something like this um, would put a lot of pressure on that black stone. Most likely black's not gonna jump into that upper side anymore. So this would be, um, you might say, the bef before AI way of handling that. And it probably gives a similar, similar. Um, it's probably not so bad as far as the points are concerned with um, AI systems either. So hmm. this would be the basically the easy way, the, the intuitive way of handling it. And the, the way that the AlphaGo handles it is it requires a lot more calculation because you have to figure out how that is all gonna link up. And there's a lot of variations. So for instance, when white jumps out here, jumping out here for black, for instance, is a very natural move. It's, it's natural for black to strengthen this black group first because this is the group that doesn't have a base. So black's moving out to the center. Um, otherwise, if black had allowed white to play this point, then um, black would have a lot more trouble getting out. So, so it would be a lot more work for black. So that's what black is doing with this move. And when white jumps out, this is where AlphaGo sort of surprised me by playing away like this. So, so this is where black might be playing something like this. And it's right. gonna be a completely different game. Uh, at some point, maybe white's gonna play some kind of an extension towards the upper side. So for instance, something like this, um, something that I would play would be something like this maybe, um, making a position on the upper side, stopping black from playing at H17. Mm -hmm. So this would be the kind of what I would call the normal way for black to play, isolating this white group on the left side and on the long term, hoping to attack it on a large scale. Um, and hopefully in a way that will build on black's two star points on the right side. So black might hope to get a, bit, a kind of a moyo there and it's gonna be a kind of a running fight. So that, that would be my idea as black. And this was to me, Playing away after this was sort of counterintuitive, but you can see how by, by making a volatile position like this, by invading on the left side, it does give a lot of uh, possible variations. It, it makes the, the game much more active for both sides. So it, it's a much more um, heavy way. It's more, um, it's a lot more work for the players to get their way through this variation. Yeah. So, so that's why I'm giving you the two choices here. It's either um, this one, uh, sorry, I mean this one. Oh no, that was different also, sorry. So I was giving you this, this choice where white takes a position on the upper side. This is what I would call the intuitive way of handling it or the game variation where white just heats things up immediately. This is really what black seemed to want, seems to want to do here. Black, by playing this um, move at D12, black was sort of inviting white in. So um, it usually takes a lot of courage to accept the offer in this case. Mm. Yeah. And black never jumps out. Like I would still want to jump out. Just I know, I know. I don't like I'm, to I'm... get surrounded there. No. But it's, uh, at this point it becomes vintage AlphaGo because it gets surrounded. And usually you'd be sort of worried about that black group on the left there. <laughs> And you know, this group here, it's, it's not alive yet. And you have this shape um, where black has played the shoulder hit here. And this is usually followed up by an extension uh, like this. So there's a kind of a shape move that black hasn't played there on the lower side also. So there seems to be something missing uh, or at least one move missing somewhere. So I, I would be, for instance, um, yeah, black played here in the game. So this was the game move. So an example of how black could handle that um, by playing something like this, or for instance, by continuing with something like this and then playing here, getting a position there, um, which would settle this group on the left. This is really the advised method here um, <laughs> for people who don't, don't like to die. Um, and it also, by not only making a live shape there, um, black has this connection towards mm -hmm. the side, which is reinforcing this group. And it's taking away the possible damage when white plays something, um, just because of the fact that black is missing this one move here on the lower side. Um, 
having a connection towards the left side on the left side there, although it's low on the third and second line, it's, it's going to be a low connection, but it does take away the potential for white to attack these stones um, by playing something like this. So, so that, that would be countered with black playing here and black would have no trouble. So that's why I would um, suggest that, especially for players who are not really, really sharp in reading, you have to be very sharp in reading to um, copy what AlphaGo did here. But th this would be a relatively easy way to handle it, and my suggested move. Of course, AlphaGo plays away. Of course. <laughs> of course, yes. Yeah, this is kind of a, one of those things. And white plays here. So huge, actually, huge. It's a big move. Yeah, it's, it's a bit slow from the living white group here. Um, so in that way, it's snow, slow, but it does control the whole mm -hmm. lower side. So it's a, a, and it's a shape move where black should have been playing at that point. But um, what I'm going to focus on here is that the moment this black group is in danger, right? It, it's, it's really, in, it's, it looks like it's in trouble. Any moves that black plays now to, to move out there are going to be giving white territory on the fourth line, like, and they're going to be painful. So this is going to be good for white because white's getting a lot of territory while chasing the black group. Black doesn't really want to play these dame points because there's, um, when black was going to play, for instance, a move like, a move like, uh, didn't do it, did I? Like a move like this on the side. Mm. And then at some later time, it's going to play here and get a territory there, maybe on the lower side. So there's this idea that maybe black's going to get some territory out of this. Or even if white plays this move, white's going to be down on the third line, right? So, so right, later right. on. Uh, white, white, black's still going to have the option of playing moves like this to, to push white down to the second line. And so it's very low for white, even if white plays, and there's some potential for black. So that's why this move would be relatively attractive to black. Whereas in the game, after white plays here, if black is playing moves like this, they're completely without any territory. Right. right. You could almost say they're pointless. And white's getting something like, in this exchange, white's already got an extra 10 points on the side. So it's painful to do that. So that's why this move is supposed to be really big. But what I want to focus on here is that in the following sequence, which is going to be sort of hard to understand, it's going to be one of the, it's going to be kind of the focus of my commentary here. There's going to be this wild sequence in which Black ends up connecting these two groups. And so uh, in that sequence, Black's going to give up something up towards the upper left corner. Mm -hmm. But in in connecting these two groups, it's going to be the exchange of this stone for this stone is going to turn out to be a profit for black. Hmm. So um, since it's going to be sort of uh, involved sequence, I, I just wanted you to have that kind of picture to start with um, a scenario that's going to unfold from here on. And black's going to end up connecting up here and white's Hane at um, H4 is going to lose a part of its value because it's not going to be attacking black anymore. And um, the interesting thing for me was that um, not only did black accomplish that, but um, to a certain degree, it was a kind of a forced sequence when I really digged in and tried to understand it. Mm. And so okay. that's, that's what, so you could say the whole thing is planned, although, you know, and computers don't think in the same way as we do. Um, but it, it, it's like it was, um, it, it's working very well together with this move that Black played at R14. Well, so if it was a human player, um, you would say that he maybe he had read it out at this point. Right. I mean, it's planned in terms of AlphaGo has got, you know, all these different sequences and it has the ability to run so many different kinds of sequences. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll give you that. Right. Okay. Oh, so uh, there, there it is. There it is. Now this move, um, it's not going to succeed in cutting white off if white wants to connect up. So what I'm saying here is that if white extends here, mm -hmm. pushing through is not going to be an option. So let's say black pushes through, white pushes through, black pushes through, white pushes through. This is already a horrible shape for black. Yeah. So if black wants to connect up here, it's going to be something like this, even if Oof. white answers at seven. At this point, white had the option of not answering at seven and doing something like this. But we're just going to assume that white's um, going to cooperate to that extent. Black has not gained anything. Um, it's, Black has just played a lot of dame points. It's like Black is filling liberties at the end of the game. Um, so it's, it's really painful. This is no good for Black at all. But what Black is going to do here 
um, Black is going to play here. And this is where this stone that Black played earlier at this point, this exchange, it's going to work a little bit. Because now, if White plays uh, something elsewhere, now Black can play like this and cut White off. A actually, Black might start with six. So let's do, the, do that in a different order. Black can start this way, this way, and this way. And this is really bad for White. It's a double threat. And either way, wh whether Black, whether White connects here and lets Black push through here, mm. or if White plays here and Black cuts, obviously. It's, it's bad for White. So this is a kind Oof. of a, White's going to be in some trouble in the corner and also has this stone, which is not connected. So one of those two is going to fall. And on the whole, it's going to be good for Black. So that's what the idea here is. Right. Um, and so when Black does that, White has to answer here. So the whole point of this was to get a stone at two so that Black could play here. So that's a, connect, a loose connection with that, um, the stone at two. So there's a kind of a loose connection happening here. And, and that was just by playing, starting with this stone here, sort of forced that sequence. So this, this is one way that Black's going to get a kind of a loose connection to the group on the, on the lower left and save everything. So that'll be really efficient. So Black wasn't going to cut immediately, but was going to play here and make use of that. Obviously, White uh, saw that coming and covered here. So this is going to lose the corner. At this point, White has uh, sort of agreed to sacrifice the corner here. Wow. Uh, it's inhuman. Uh, Literally. Obviously. Yeah. So White jumps. Black plays here. The corner is dead. OK, so White plays here. So what's the idea with this? So I'm going to show you a relatively simple Oof. variation where black can capture white's corner. Black at this point, white black can capture the corner. So how does that happen? Black can play here once. White connects underneath, and at this point, the key point, the key move that a human professional would think of first was was would be this one. This is the move, the shape move. It's the tesuji. Why is it a tesuji? It's because uh, if white plays here, which is what I think white should do. And black's gonna play here and cut here. And it's gonna be uh, one of those things that looks like a code, but it's not. Oh dear. Uh, even if white, like even if white at some point earlier had played this exchange and then comes down, it's still not gonna work. It's still the same squeeze. Oh, that's way so too cool. That is so cool. Wow, wow. <laughs> and like this is, um, for uh, a professional player, this is pretty elementary. The, the whole thing is child's play. Child's play, yeah, very nice. So, so playing here is, at at one here and making that threat is what a professional would do. Um, I mean, a human professional. Um, it's what I would expect a human professional to do. And if white gets really stubborn and tries to save the corner, you might note that this white corner is dead as it stands. So all black has to do is Black has to um, make the outside group healthy. And Black can do that by playing the honey here. And cap this actually will probably capture those two white stones. So for instance, um, oh yeah. OK, so white cuts. And if white connects here, uh, Black plays here. And what I was doing with the exchange of three for four here, I was just getting rid of the threat of white wedging here. So yeah, that was sort of important. But you can see White's lost those two stones. White's probably going to play here. In this case, White's move at two was completely wasted. And everything's dead. And Black has a very nice territory there. Black has a very weak group on this side. But um, all Black has to do is survive now. Mm. Black has so much territory. All Black has to do is make two eyes. I, I, I don't really see this move, this group dying. Um, unless Black makes some mistakes. It, it's going to struggle a little bit, but it should be able to, to live on a small scale. And that territory in the upper left is so big that that would be good enough for Black. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's how I would probably handle it. I would probably handle it by play, playing here, but not AlphaGo. AlphaGo plays here. So this is actually, it works also as an explanation of what White is trying to do in sacrificing the corner, because White's going to do something like this, and it's going to have a nice territory on the outside and has sacrificed something like 15 points in the upper left corner, but is going to continue to attack black in the lower left. So you can see, obviously, this is much better for white than that variation where white was a bit too stubborn. And this is how white is going to handle that. 
and it's going to be pretty much even. It's going to be pretty much even, but it's sort of according to White's game plan here. It's making good use of this stone to continue to attack Black there. And uh, the corner, the way White sacrifices it here, it's relatively small. So this is what White would do to handle that. And Black is basically is saying no to this variation by playing here immediately. And like, if we, it, it, you could say it doesn't work. I, <laughs> I will say, yeah. It, it doesn't work in a number of ways. For instance, if white cuts here, uh, what is black gonna do? If black I, saves the two stones here, black's gonna lose the stone here. One of these is gonna drop. Right. And actually what black is gonna do is black is gonna sacrifice the two stones and oh yeah that the corner. is nice and this is probably okay for black um like black lost a lot towards the center but that corner is going to be a black territory and there's a kind of a potential connection thing here right 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 so yeah so that's how black's going to handle that okay all right um works. so but what if white plays this move which is the game move? so in this case so this is what happened and so I was showing you the same variation with a black stone here and a white stone here. So this, this time, when it was like this, it was working really well. Although I also played this exchange just to make sure white didn't get that wedge on the fourth line, right? So I, I, it worked for black in this case. So what about this case? It's not working, but it's, it is sort of, it's working in a crazy way. So like if white <laughs> plays here, oh, sorry, I'm, using the wrong tool. So if white plays here, this is going to be, um, this is going to be very similar to the variation I was showing earlier. Yep, yep, yep. Only it doesn't, it doesn't have this exchange. It would have been even better for black with this exchange, but you know, um, it's, it's good enough for black even without that exchange. So um, instead white connected and black extends. White plays here, white plays in a tart. So at this point, we're gonna get some practice in Tesuji here uh -oh. because uh -oh. the white stones, um, if you start from this, if black starts from this point, the white stones have four liberties, but in actuality, black can fill those liberties more quickly. So white has only three liberties. Uh, black also has three liberties, but because this white stone here is weak, white has to prepare once. So that's what this move is. and if black connects here, white's gonna win the race to capture. So where does black play? I want you to guess AlphaGo's next move. And it's, it's sort of a trick question because there's two answers. No, I'm you not, have to uh, find the one that AlphaGo chose. I'm gonna look at it, but I'm gonna call on my, uh, my, my trusty, our trusty uh, viewers here to help me out, guys. We're, uh, let, me, let me take a look at it, but all right, what do we, what do we got here, folks? Give me some, uh, give me some. And, and Eva D, you can get in on this too. I know you want to. All right, let me take a look here. So that one doesn't work. Uh, man. I mean, you know, one always likes A11, you know, Yohane. Um, mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So, like, for uh, that's right, actually. It's, it's right as far as the uh, problem is concerned. Uh -oh. It's not the move that AlphaGo played. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't you know, ask me. You didn't ask me that. I don't oh, know. That is what I asked. But, you I, I know, it's a correct answer uh, to this position. Oh, okay. Because I don't know but what It's really Alpha, weird Alpha. that AlphaGo <laughs> chose the other move, which is this one. Um, so, like, oh, oh, even cooler. The human answer to this problem would be this one. I mean, no, no, not that one. Um, would be this one. Just the regular. Just because answer. this is the shape that's going to work in work more generally in similar positions. This is the shape that's going to work most of the time. So this is the more generally correct move. But AlphaGo, for some reason, these neural networks tend to find a different way to do it sometimes. And so, so that's what's happening here. It works exactly the same way. So. Um, the idea is that if black, white plays an Atari here, black doesn't have to connect that one stone and can win by two moves now. So white, um, let's see. So yeah, 
So, and if white plays here, black has time to play the target and still only two liberties. So if uh, at some point white had managed to play this exchange here, then this would be a kind of a position where black has no way to fill the liberties easily because white can play here and make two eyes, make an eye that is. And when white makes an eye, it makes it more difficult for black to fill the liberties there. So this would be, this would actually be a co. Um, but it's not realistic because that diagonal move on the second line, it was, this is not actually forcing. Right. Right. Um, so it's an, this is the, the whole stuff around all of this stuff around is I, I like it because it's um, it's tesuji, it's things that you will find in your own games. So it's important in that way. But it's really crazy that AlphaGo chose the different move, which in some cases would be wrong, but in this case it's not a problem. So if, nice. if white plays here, black can still play here. You can see that the liberties are getting filled up. So white takes the one stone and black plays here. It's the same end result. And so, as I was saying earlier in, in this commentary, black, black managed to connect up to this group. And so the big take for Black is that this, this move that White played um, with the idea, you might say, of attacking Black in the lower left, um, that extra value to that move that White played at H4 is, is gone now. Um, for White, uh, White still, uh, White has this extreme strength in this area. So right. um, white, white got something out of it also. And white does have sente. And the fact that all of the white stones that are alive on the board at this point, all of those stones are very, very strong. It means that white doesn't have to worry about the center of the board anymore. It's not as if uh, white's going to get a big moyo here because the area is relatively small. But um, the fact that white doesn't have to worry about the center of the board or anything good for black happening towards the center of the board, um, it, it takes a lot of the value away from the star points because uh, now I, I want to talk about what a star point play is in the beginning of the game. So in the, just in the beginning of the game, you play star points, you probably don't think very deeply about them, but actually the star point is a move that is saying, go ahead and take the corner territory like this. Right. And in return, black is gonna get a wall towards the center of the board. So um, when we compare it to a 3-3 point or even a 3-4 point, like the moves that White was playing on the left side of the board, the star point is not emphasizing the corner territory as much as those other moves that are closer to the side of the board. Um, and the payback is that Black is getting something towards the center. So the fact that White has, in a way, nullified Black's potential towards the center is the big payback for White. It's the, it's the big advantage that white has gotten from this whole um, fight, because otherwise it was just some extra points in this area and connecting up to the, mm. corner, the, cor the corner that is. Um, so white did gain something like 10, 15 points in that area, but black got a lot of points too. Black got a nice territory here while connecting up. That's well over 10 points. Um, so the territorial gain for white is limited, while the fact that white got a big wall here and black is not gonna get very much in the center now, it means that you would sort of wish that these star points were not at star points, but were at the three three points. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they're in, it, it makes the star points less effective than they would be if the center was a, a valuable center. That makes game. sense, yeah. So that's the, the, the kind of the hidden value in, in white getting into this variation. And of course, as in the case of most AlphaGo games, it's, it's very close still. So to go back to the game, at this, after this, you could say the game is in the end game already because nothing is going to die, you might right. think. And they're they're going to change that. Don't <laughs> <worry>. <laughs> so black, uh, so yeah. So when you get into the later stages of the game, this is the advice way of handling a 3-3 point invasion. Um, if you continue with a joseki like this or even one of the more modern josekis, you're building a wall and that wall is not going to do anything in this right. kind of board position. Right. So when you get into a position where the value of the center or the sides of the board is relatively small, it's okay for black to play the double honey. And I say that because if you play it right at the beginning of the game, it's supposed to be a small loss. Like if you look at it with an AI, in most cases, you're going to see black lose a few points in the score. So like if it was 50-50 before black played that, then it's probably going to give you something like 45, somewhere between 45 and 50. Right. Um, it's just a few points. Like a human player doesn't notice that, but people who work with research with AIs 
will be sort of bothering. They, they, they will know. We will know that it's not supposed to be the optimal move in early stages of the game. But as the game pro progresses like this and the value of the sides and the center is reduced, which happens in most cases, then it becomes a good move. So mm -hmm. as a kind of a rule of thumb, you can say that um, the later the game is, the, the further on you get in the game, the more likely it is that this move is going to be good. Hey, so can you just the, show the, people real quick the, um, there's, there's basic, there's two common variations out of this, right? Okay, yeah. Well, the game variation is, this and this is the only one that uh, a neural network will advise to. So like this. So this is right. very straightforward. Black has given up that one stone to get the corner. Uh, there's also a variation where white is going to play a honey on this side, mm -hmm. and the neural networks don't like this. It's a local loss for white, basically. It's just that this territory is bigger for black. Sometimes you will see a neural network telling you to play here. It's just because it's good for black already. Humans don't like to do that because it gives white an in-game play in the corner um which is sort of neat for white and it, it sometimes it has to do with the life or death of that white group on the side so it's it, it's really good that white has this move at nine so human players will generally play here to get the big corner territory mm. it's just that this territory is bigger than the other one and white is still weak with a potential attack from from this point for black so so white's position on the lower side is slightly worse than the real Joseki and the direction of it's basically it depends on the direction of play so if, like if the lower side is enormously more important than the right side sometimes white's going to do this okay mm -hmm. thank you so yeah this is the Joseki you have to remember so let's just go through those moves once more um you cover here when you cover mm -hmm. when you see a computer program covering here you just about know that it's going to be playing the double hunter. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't play that old fashioned Joseki. And white can capture the one black stone. And black can capture the corner. And something that annoys me here. Okay. Tell um, us. Tell us. You see, you see AIs, all these computer programs. Um, you see them playing a Sagari down to the second line here immediately. You see that in a lot of AlphaGo games. Yeah. You see all of the neural networks like to do this. And the, the, to give them an excuse for doing that, I will say that it does make the next co-threat big. But, you know, playing here is such a terrible move locally. It's creating a, a co-threat that is sure to be forcing, whereas sometimes white one is not. So there's that. And there's the fact that it has established this forcing move here. So there's some reason to it. but usually. Like human professionals hate to play this move because it's losing a potential co threat. And I always thought that uh, computer programs, I wondered if they realized that or something, or maybe right. not. Um, they're, they're sort of weird in the way they play codes sometimes. Um, but I, seeing AlphaGo not playing it in this particular board position, um, it sort of relieves me and tells me that maybe AlphaGo does know mm. because. Um, in this position, white is, you can see white is jumping into the 3-3 three, three point even again. And again, it's the case that the center of the board is relatively small. So white's jumping into the 3-3 three, three point here. It seems very confined, but this is actually potentially going to be a co. And white's going to use R2 as a co-threat. So uh, AlphaGo is actually planning to use R2 as a co-threat, just as a human professional would. So it's, I'm, I'm happy to see that. I, it's actually thinking in a way that is understandable to me as a human. Mm. It's as if it was, it really understood that humans like to keep that as a co threat. So if black plays here, this is going to be the one co threat that white can play without losing any points. Like even a co threat like this is, it's theoretically, it's a bad exchange when black plays here. So it's, it's something white doesn't really want to do. This would be bad too, it would be losing points. So white has co threats, but doesn't want to use those. But um, this one is not losing anything. So it's, sort of perfect, just what a human player would like to do would be able to play this co -threat. Um Timely, a timely co -threat. And it's a move that has its purposes because as you can see with computer programs playing it, but professional, human professionals like to keep it wait until they can play it as a co -threat. That's more, right. more efficient. And so that's what AlphaGo is gonna do here. And it, it works the same way it would work for me or a human professional. So that made me happy. All right, but well, that's and, what it's all about. We want you to be happy, Mark. 
unusually, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could understand what's going on, or at least I think I, so black played here. Black has sort of given up on the idea of that code because white has an advantage in code dress. Like right. if you look at the whole board position, you don't really see any areas where black seems to have good code dress. No. So black gave, it, gave up on yeah, that. Yeah, vital, um, vital. This is a vital point and covered here. So black's taking the territory on the right side and hoping to attack this white group. A normal way for white to continue here would be to play here. Black has to do something about the corner, can jump, or black can play here. And white would play something like this. And black would start building on the left, the right side there. Maybe white would be getting something towards the center of the board in this kind of fight. And this would be about even. This is how I would probably handle this position. But AlphaGo plays this. This is really, it would be very difficult for me to choose this move. Wow. And why? Wow. Because now it's a huge co when black plays here. And what's more, it's, it's a huge co um, for white to lose. Because if white wins, if black wins this co, the whole corner is going to be dead anyway. Um, and it's relatively easy for black to handle this because moves like six will be local co threats. Black doesn't have any danger here. In fact, white's going to end up playing bad co threats. Aye, aye, aye. And black, black can just give up the co because uh, getting two, two moves on the outside is going to be good enough. Um, it's, mm. it's not a big loss for black. And so, uh, so basically what I'm saying with this whole thing is that white doesn't have the option, oh, sorry, white doesn't have the option of playing a co anymore when white cuts and black plays here. The cut is, has, becomes a liability because black can play co-threats against that stone if white starts to co. So once white cuts, white has to connect here. So this group that was virtually alive because of the co, or also after black played this exchange, it was alive because white could capture this stone. So it was alive. White's creating a clump of dead stones there potentially. Black connects it um, at, at S S15. So it's really painful to have to connect here. And it's something that I would just discard because of this one, one fact. But we're gonna see how AlphaGo makes it work. Okay. So black pulls out and white plays here. So this is kind of the key move here, in which case if black answers on the second line, which might seem to be the natural move, white's gonna cover here. Black definitely doesn't want white to wedge at 90 and 18. So maybe here, but this is this is gonna turn very bad for black. Mm. black here. Um, th those stones in the center and the stones on the side are in danger. Um, even if black somehow manages to win this, it's, it's not going to be unconditional. It's going to be a core or something, or maybe a seki. Well, you can imagine a kind of a wall of white stones here with black capturing the corner. You can see that white's probably going to capture the, the right side here. Well, so, not, so not to mention a lot of options. The, uh, the Moyo that's building yeah. up in the top right. center there too. Just about however it turns out, it's going to be bad for black. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, um, so black couldn't do that. And in the game, oh yeah, jumped ahead again. Okay. In the game, black answered on this side. So this is the shape move. Um, th this was the shape move. It's, it's setting up when white covers here. You see what white seems to be trying to do is white's trying to attack this group or at least uh, squeeze it a little bit. So when black pushes through here, um, this move, the stone on the fourth line is stopping white from covering at L16. So white extends, and this is a really beautiful move. Um, you might think white was going to play a kind of an Atari maybe, but this is, it's just really bad. It, it becomes more difficult for white to connect up actually. So it's a kind of a clumsy move. Like if white does stuff like this, this would just be, it would be inviting disaster. So white does have a bit of a problem there and avoids it by jumping here. So by jumping here, black, um, it doesn't really seem to be close to this stone, but the black is not going to have an easy way to capture that stone. So for instance, let's just go through various ways black might try to net that stone. Obviously this is white's just gonna push through here. White has to be careful because that corner group, it only has four liberties. So right. white has to keep black down to four liberties so that when black plays here, uh, white can play something and win the, this only wins by one move. In this mm. So one has to be careful of that. 
So that didn't work. If black pushes through here, white can push through here mm -hmm. and it escapes one way or the other. Um, if black plays here, uh, this is where white has to be careful of the, um, let's see. Actually, I think white would play the cut on this side. I, I um, Sorry, I didn't research this one. Yeah, so this, this is probably working better. And white's probably going to end up uh, sacrificing the corner and doing something like this. I'm just sort of guessing here, but it is going to put some pressure on that black group on the on the left there. Hmm. And like if white's one move away from a seki in the corner, so it's it's not completely dead yet. Like if white gets in the process of squeezing this black group, if black has to use has to use this stone, then this is going to be next move. It's going to be a seki in the corner. Um, so for instance, uh, let's just do it this way. This would be a seki. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so it's the fact that it's one move away means any move along this line is going to be forcing, and it's, it's going to make a difference um, to the the group that black has on the left there, in various ways. So that was just the simplest way. Okay. Let's see if I can find the game variation. So uh, black just connected, white pulled out, and black played an Atari here. And this is where white, if white connects, white's going to be in trouble. Yeah. As black can push through and connect, yeah. cut one side or the other. Yep. So um, this is where white played. And if white plays elsewhere, black doesn't even have to take the one stone because black's going to be one move ahead now. So black can win the race to capture. White only has three liberties. Right. Yeah. So white had to play here. This is the game variation. And um, black doesn't really want to go after those white stones. So like black could play something like this and something like this to capture those stones. But it's, it's even if white just does something very simple like this, let's see, oh, I actually made this very, yeah. Um, and like this, black has to add a stone to the upper side. So I guess here, and you can see it's, uh, white's getting a lot in the center and squeezed the upper side. The right side is down to the fourth line. I think black is, uh, I don't have any more. Black probably has to curl around here. Um, and the, the white group on this side, it's going to be reinforced. White's going to get some territory in sense. So this is sort of working for white. Yeah. OK, jumping ahead of myself again. Yeah. OK, so black extended. So uh, still white cannot connect here because black's going to push through. So white has to answer here. So what Black's doing here is stopping White from playing a honey at the same point. This is kind of a key point, which reinforces Black's group on the top side. And now Black just sacrifices those stones. So this is uh, pretty brilliant, actually. Um, saving those stones is a big move. Uh, White's going to answer here. And again, if Black sort of allows White to get this kind of shape, Black does have to worry about that group on the top. It's locally, uh, this, this space here, it's not two eyes yet. So black really locally black would need another stone here to make it a living shape. And so, so black doesn't really want that to happen. It's sort of painful to have to put a stone in there. Even if black uh, tries something first, it, it, eventually black's gonna have to put that stone in. So black doesn't want that. Um, if we assume black does something like this, then white's gonna get into the right side. So um, on the whole, capturing it one, it doesn't give black any eye space. And it, it sort of slows black down a bit too much. So it's not worth so much now that white has lived in the corner. Mm -hmm. So black immediately changes, you might say it changes its mind. But this is uh, super efficient for it to, after it's sort of squeezed out some extra potential from these stones by forcing white to play this move to live on the right side, um, it, it immediately gains a move by jumping here, putting pressure on the white group on the, in the lower right. If white continues to escape in that direction, eventually black's going to capture it P16. So it's a kind of a combination there where black is gaining more by just simply threatening to play its P16 instead of playing it immediately would be too dangerous. So white takes black plays here. I love this move. Uh, probably going into too much too much detail today. I'm getting so excited. This is just really weird in a position. Well, as far as this group is concerned, um, it's sort of if we isolate this black group, it's probably a co now. So it's, it's not 100% alive, um, but it's better than dying outright. So there is some significance to getting a stone at L19. 
Um, it, it takes the black group one step closer to being safe. But a human player would sort of automatically, um, having understood that L19 is important, wouldn't you want to play the Hanetsugi? Yes, you right? would. Yes, you would. It's an extra profit. It's making white's territory smaller. Okay. Uh, so the point is, when we look at this position, and we say at some point Black's going to play a Hane here, maybe. Mm-hmm. It's a big move that Black could play at some point in the game. When that Black does that, the next move is not forcing. White, that, that Black group on the side is dead anyway. White's winning the semi um, because if Black... Uh, if I see it. Dead, I see yeah. it. Oh, that's so cool. So Black, instead of doing that, and, and you might notice that um, in this variation, these stones, Black fill the liberty of these stones. So basically... If white wants to keep that position where white is winning the race to capture, even if black fills two liberties here, white can do that by answering this move um, with a diagonal, which was not what AlphaGo did. But if white plays here, basically it's gonna be the same, same situation. Only this black group is more healthy because it has this open liberty. And the white territory is gonna be the same too. So white could have avoided um, the extra forcing move from the outside by playing here, but that extra liberty, it would make a real difference in the health of black's group. It's, that's important. It's something that um, humans would also consider important. So white covers here. When white does this, now let's look at that. Black played here anyway. Now later on, if we assume that black plays here, now this is gonna be a forcing move, this or, or, or this, either way, because black can connect here and uh, white white has three liberties, black has three liberties. You would assume that the player playing first is going to win, but right. white really has no way to fill liberties here. Like um, White playing on Atari here, the fact that it's filling white's own liberties is pretty obviously bad. So it's, it's just not working for white. So that this, zero, by playing zero, this already at L19, black got an extra forcing move potentially from the outside. Isn't that brilliant? That is absolutely brilliant. I, I, if somebody played that against me, I would think it was a click go. I don't, you know, it's just. Yeah. Didn't you mean to play M19? You right. Know, I, right. I, you'd probably ask your opponent. I would. Yeah. Undo ask. time. Undo. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and undo. Yeah. By, by, yeah. by the way, just to reassure, <laughs> just to reassure you and give you a, a little tea break there. Uh, our, our readers, uh, our viewers, sorry, assure us that there's no such thing as too much detail. So, okay, great. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, so Black, um, instead of covering immediately, which would be a big move, but it would allow White to, um, covering here would allow White to escape on this side, obviously. Um, so Black plays there. This pretty much finishes off uh, the White group on the. On right. The, there's no way out. Yeah. So um, white could play here, but then black would start. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly where black would play on the right side. Black would play something on the right side to make that territory also. <coughs> reasonable, I think it's reasonable that white invaded here and black jumped. And you can see black is setting up to play this move. Black mm. has one more forcing move there. It's going to be an issue. So like if white plays something like this, black will immediately play here and white will have to put a stone in. Right, so, so having this forcing move is something that Black is sort of looking forward. Black mm-hmm. might play on the side. Um, I don't know. It could work this way, actually. And, and then Black would have pretty much eye space there. So what White did was interesting. And one of the variations I saw was Katago was interesting too. So what Black did, what White did in the game is White played here mm. and then played here. So just by starting with that, White has sort of put a thorn in Black's side with this stone and has resolved the whole idea of Black having forcing moves against White. Um, and, and I think part of the problem was that maybe Black could have started with, um, with this move and even got an extra forcing move here, right? So, so that would be two forcing moves from outside. Right. Yeah, so that, that's a, an explanation of why White started that. Uh, the variation that Katago was showing me was white playing here. This was really neat in that it's not giving black a chance to do that. So if black does something like this, white does this, and we get into a position like this, 
where black can actually uh, get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. What do that again in slow motion? Wait a minute. Uh, yeah. So if black, it, it might be actually better for black to play here, but still white can play here. Oh, clever. And okay. Here. Okay. Yep. Yep. And yep. then it's going to cut here. Right. And by cutting at seven, white has saved the stone at three and can play here. You can see black's group on the right is actually potentially getting into trouble here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, if, if this kind of fight is, is not going to be attractive for black. It, it's not as if black's going to die out, right? But the whole point of forcing with two was sort of a lot of the value of that was taken away. Mm. So this is the move that I saw in one of the variations with Kadago, and, um, and it had black playing here and then white playing here again, keeping that pressure on. So basically stopping black from playing one of these moves that would be relatively attractive and trying to force black to play a move like this, which would be sort of less attractive. It would be a kind of a dull move, not feeling a liberty. It wouldn't be so exciting. So this is what AlphaGo wanted white to do. And I mean, uh, Katago. And right. AlphaGo chose this way. It's sort of hard to say which is better. This also resolves the whole problem and makes it, and that stone, the marked stone there is, it's eventually going to be forcing Black to do something about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Black played here. And in this, this is the obviously the strong move that White plays and Black pulls back and White plays here. Um, it's um, important that White has a potential co at the T8 point. Right. Um, so actually, it's conceivable that Black should have actually pulled back, uh, not gone all the way there and played here, in which case uh, something like this would happen. And White would not have that goal there. And Black would um, be fairly close to having two eyes with that group uh, on the side. So this is another option that Black had. But Black played two space jump. Um, at this point, it's, it's already starting to look like a half point difference. Um, in all the variations that I've researched. So I guess it's hard to say which is better. And so mm. Black plays here. With this, uh, Black has captured this group for the time being. Yeah. And also because of the fact that uh, White can play here and um, take away some of Black's eye space, it's also significant that Black has the potential Watari here. So the connection underneath um, takes away the danger of this move. So for instance, if White continues with something like this, um, Black does have to pay attention to that group on the top, um, but can push a lot, push up to 10. White has to keep on answering. And then eventually Black can put a stone in here. Um, White's just played a lot of clumpy, useless points, right? So White's not gained anything in points here. Black's actually getting more with those stones at six, eight, and 10, these three stones, mm -hmm. these three stones here. Um, and always has the connection underneath. So it's not really worthwhile for white to try to attack black after black plays the stone at t8 right, so white right. didn't do that white did no. the opposite i just could so say that's... white white actually winds up being attacked himself in the center right. so he gets in a lot of trouble so white played this move <coughs> um a very vulgar looking move like it's saying go ahead and connect but um, as i just displayed it it's not a good idea for white to try to cut there so if white plays here and then cuts here um, of course, it's a much more forceful move. So I would probably start with capturing the one stone first, but this, this would be a much more forceful way to cut. So Black has to answer this. Yeah. So yeah, Black just, answered. Yeah, just straight. Yeah. What did White do with this exchange? White was actually saving the center group with Sente because there's this huge move towards the lower side. And so there's this huge move here, um, which White wanted to get to. So White didn't really have the leisure to play a move like this, which would not be forcing and would allow Black to play somewhere on the lower side. Let's see, where, where should we play? Maybe something like this. So actually, while we're thinking about that, let's, let's have uh, viewers think about that. But uh, Rory Smart guy has a really good question that I was actually just sort of thinking about, um, but she, she says AlphaGo versus AlphaGo is totally balanced, right? White and Black both agree on the value strength of all groups, so they can't trick each other. So he's wondering if you think that that shows in these games, um, 
which is probably pretty self-evident, but the second question is pretty interesting, is whether human games are like this when the players are equally matched. That seems like a right. trickier question. Okay, so we're talking about top human professionals, you might say. Right. Um, and um, especially in the middle game, quite often they do agree. Um, uh, but of course, humans make mistakes. Um, so that's part of it. Um, mistakes in reading or calculation or just oversights. So there's that thing also, but in general, um, our positional judgment agrees to a certain degree, unless it's a really close game and it requires mm -hmm. um, some extra skill, you might say. Um, and so in many cases, a large part of it is preparation, especially nowadays when people are getting um, answers with AIs. Mm -hmm. And so they can place, they can um, devise their own opening, which is not necessarily the advised moves 100%. It's something that they want to play mm. and they will know what, what, um, what the valuation of it, it by the computer is, which is very reliable. The, the scores that the computers give us are reliable enough that we can work with them. Although they are not um, the same as, it doesn't calculate it the same way as we do. Like we, we count the size of territories and stuff like that. Um, so it, it doesn't come out that way, but we can understand the scores given to the degree that we can choose from various moves that we want to play and find the best variation, for instance, in my case, for myself, which I want to do so I can have a whole opening researched. And so the quality of that research, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort because mm. it's really, it's very tiring to, to you, um, converse with an AI. Like it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> They're tough guys. So, um, but the players who have done that to the, so when you look at top players, like especially top Chinese players do a lot of AI research and the top Japanese players, of course, top Korean players throughout the world, they do a lot of AI research and you can see them playing almost perfect openings from like, you can look at the AI score, which you can do nowadays, most servers allow you to do that. And it's pretty level. It doesn't move around a lot until they get to the middle game. So it's, mm. um, in many cases, like the difference between that level of player and what you might call a second rate um, top, uh, again, a top professional it can be another nine down, but a player who's not like um, in con um, com competition for the world champion or something like that. The difference would be the level of their understanding uh, their digestment of this kind of AI research. Mm -hmm. Because we can, we can memorize the variations. Anyone can memorize the variations, but it takes a lot of effort and, and, um, uh, and a lot of skill to be able to actually understand what's going on. Right. And, and you have to, because your opponent's not going to play the same moves all the time. And your, your, your opponent is a human and, player. And, yeah. I was going to say, I think that's, that's the big difference when you've got human players, because, you know, the question sort of answers itself. The human players are not exactly the same. It's not like AlphaGo, which is mm -hmm. the same machine. Right? Mm -hmm. um, right. So of course it has the same tools, but the human players right. they're they're you know, there, there are no two human players that have exactly the same, skill set the same temperament i mean there's so much more that goes that makes right, yeah. makes it up um that, mm -hmm. that i think that's that's the uh the difference i think what you're saying is that because of all the ai uh and, and certainly in the opening uh you know when there's you know i don't want to say less variation but you know where people follow patterns i guess you could say right so but, there's the potential there to, to have a very um accurate understanding of a certain opening Sure. The, 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 the game itself is, there's so much variation in the game itself right. that um, you sort of have to look out to a certain degree to get into the exact variation that you know about. Mm -hmm. So um, the people at the top have the precise information. They, they have various openings that they just sort of know. And they also have the general knowledge to, to, to be able to work around uh, when the opening is a little different from what the computer knows. Right. And so you see them playing almost perfect games up to something like 50 moves. And right. then, then they're all, out, of, out of their knowledge. And, all, all hell breaks loose. And yeah, because, because the games have short time limits, I think the quality and the speed of calculation um, becomes very important towards the middle game and end game. Right. Very good question. Thanks for asking that, uh, folks. And again, we're live, so uh, you can pose those kinds of questions and uh, we will do our best to answer them.
So let's play safe and put it one line. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, really, really? Yeah. Well, this is going to be a win for Black. Okay. Um, playing first on the lower side is good enough. I don't want to give White an opportunity to to mess with that area. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. So White played here and took Sente to get to this point. So that was important. And I would still want to play here on the lower side. Um, it's sort of interesting in this kind of shape, um, in an opening position, if you played here, especially before we had AIs, you would be told off. You would say that's too close to the white stone. Mm -hmm. And people would tell you that. that this is the good shape. And um, there are some exceptions nowadays that people understand because of research with AIs. But usually this is true. It's true that you want to have one line between your black stone on the third line with your opponent's stone on the third or fourth line. It's, it's, this is generally you want to keep a one line between the two stones. Social, social but, distancing, one, one right, might social say. Social distancing. <laughs> um, and the point I want to make here is that it becomes less true towards the end of the game. So in the end game, uh, we're, we're not talking about potential towards the center or anything like that. Uh, the sides and the edges of the board become more important. Mm -hmm. And so this is a kind of position where it would actually be okay for Black to play all the way here and just go for as much space on the side as possible. So like early in the game, this would, the reason this would be bad would, would be because it's giving White extra forcing moves um, from above. And this would have an effect towards the center of the board. But you can see in this game, the center is probably not so important anymore. So it's an example of how the edges of the board uh, become more important towards the end of the game. And, 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 and Sente. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Sente, yeah. But instead, Black uh, plays. So this is a move where Black is still trying to attack White in the center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a sort of, it's almost a human looking move because humans would sort of want to want to keep some pressure on that White group. But it's um, it takes some courage to do that because... <laughs> Excuse me. The lower side here, this move here on the lower side is such a huge move. It's the final big move towards the side. Mm. And so playing this way with black, I would be just a little bit worried um, yeah. that I was falling behind in territory. Mm -hmm. But Alphaco makes it work. This is important because if black leaves it, um, then playing, playing this move is going to be a forcing move for white. Um, and it's going to be, this is just even adding a, a stone here is really big. So black didn't uh, allow that. And now white returns. To, this is where it gets uh, an end game position. Oh, wow. it would calm down. It gets a bit crazy here. Black plays here. So this is a move that would be <laughs> hard for me to find. It would be hard for me to find. Um, basically, black has a fairly strong position on this side, um, especially the, the stones here, the knight's move connection. So if white cuts, uh, for the time being, Black's threatening the ladder. If, if Black plays here, actually Black is connected up on the other side because of those two white stones being weak. So this would not work for White. So um, if White cuts, White's getting into trouble because White's group on the right is going to die. So White can't cut there. And this is, oh, let's see, is this not the game move? Oh, White played something first. White played here first. There's no meaning to these in-between moves. They're just confusing me. So when black pushes through, uh, there's there's a ladder to capture these two stones. Yeah, so yeah. That's yeah. gonna um, that's gonna make it relatively difficult for white. So white curls around here, avoiding the ladder, and black plays here. So this is a um, this is a beautiful move. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the game, white jumped away, avoiding a squeeze. But uh, you just you're sort of tempted to cut somewhere, right? Uh, yeah, there's case, so many cutting Atari. points. And playing an Atari here, um, if white plays here, black gets to squeeze. And this is going to put a lot of pressure on that white group. Something like this. And, and you can see white's glob of stones here. It's not really accomplishing very much. Ugh. And surprisingly enough, black's perfectly OK on this side. It's still a connected shape. So white's just uh, being forced to play a lot of dominant points. It wasn't good. The squeeze was painful. But if white pushes through here, now this is going to be a direct threat to play here next. So white has to escape with those stones, uh, probably jump out one of these places. 
-hmm. and black gets to connect here. So actually, um, it doesn't do white any good. This would be self-defeating for white to, to cut at one because black captures that stone there. Yeah. So that's how that was working for black. It was um, all those cutting points, they're sort of enticing for white, but uh, it's not a good idea for white to cut there. So white jumped, at, jumped away and escaped in the center. This is probably the biggest move towards the sides. And white cuts in the center. So we're coming to the end of the game. Mm. And they have one more fight in the, yeah, they, they, they never stop fighting. So black jumps out <laughs> here course. and plays here. And white pushes through. So that was kind of a, there was a kind of threat there where black was thinking of, um, of doing something like this and cutting off that white group on the right still. So that's that's what was sort of happening with black putting this stone and exchanging mm -hmm. working well for black. And so that's what white did with uh, pushing through here and capturing that black stone. Um, this was threatening to escape um, at this point. So white had to answer that. And it was really neat that black played this first because pretty soon black's gonna be forcing white to take on this point also. So getting this exchange was a slight gain. You know how I, how I enjoy these fine points here. I know you do. And black, so this is the final decisive fight here where black wedges here and white cannot save the two stones. White jumped. So it's a question between this move. Also this move would have worked. This might've been slightly better, but I'm not going to really make a guess because it's gonna be half a point one way or the other. And I don't really know. Wow. Um, I, I didn't really research the, it's gonna be a something like an 80 move end game. I didn't research. So in this work, kind of getting kind of slack there, aren't you, Michael? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I'm sort of giving up every time Alpha goes right. <laughs> right. It's um, disappointing, you know. I, I, I want, I wanted to catch Alpha Go somewhere. One of these and, days. One of these days. Not yet. So when White plays here, this becomes an exquisite move, in which if White connects here, uh, then Black is going to take on this side. So Black's going to push through here. And playing something like this, for instance, is an efficient type of move. But it's, uh, you might note that moves like this are forcing for Black. Black doesn't really have to play them yet, but has these forcing moves and continue with this, which is going to create a co in the center of the board. It's going to be really bad for White. Aye, aye, aye. So there's this co here, which is exaggerated in its value by the exchange that Black played with this move and this move. So like if that exchange was not there, White well, would have no shortage of liberties and the danger would be relatively small. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. um, so there would be various ways that White could handle it. So for instance, um, another way would be to play here and then be jumping out here. Um, if there's no shortage of liberties, um, it's a much easier call for white to be playing. So it's, it's, it's still a call, but it's it's not as if there's a big clump of white stones that are in Atari. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's what black is doing with this wedge. When black wedges here, black is setting up this dangerous call because just because it would be so inefficient for white to connect here and black would get this point, it would be a big territory for black. And so... White really wants to do something a bit more efficient and get into the black territory. So that's what black is doing with this exchange here. So it's threatening to, to this would be a devastating call for white. It would be bad. So white isn't going to avoid that by taking here. So just let's go back once and mm. explain. Oh, actually it's gonna show in the game. So I showed you black playing on this side. You might be wondering what happens if black plays on the other side. So mm -hmm. let's, see, let's see that in the game variation. So this exchange of this Atari for this capture, it was a very subtle gain for Black in territory. Black got a very subtle advantage in playing that exchange in points. Like Black gained a fraction of a point. Just believe me. I believe you. I'm, I'm yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and so, yeah. So I, this I, is I, I maybe I, I where the game might have changed to what I would expect to be a half point win for White to a half point win for Black. So it was it was it was something very subtle like this exchange that changed it. I sort of my feeling is that it's probably at this point where black 
established a half point victory. Interesting. Um, so when black pushes through <coughs> on this side, when black pushes through here, white's move is to cut here and to break through like this. So this is, um, yeah, black didn't forget to play that exchange. That's important. And then pushes through here. Uh, white is going to sacrifice those two stones, but gets to reduce most of the standard territory. So that's how this worked for white. And this whole exchange here, it's just, they're playing with the order of moves a little bit. <laughs> but white, basically, a human player would just rush to play this exchange because it's mm -hmm. forcing. And it would be really, really painful if black played the target of the three stones. But AlphaGo just left it to the final possible point playing moves that were forcing elsewhere on the board. Um, so it's, it's something that AlphaGo did. It always, always did that. And I sometimes see it with the other AlphaGo networks. They're really annoying that they don't play the necessary move first. They find forcing moves to do first and they, they, they're playing with your understanding of the game. Something like that is happening here with Black um, playing these moves here before connecting here, which is obviously a forcing move, and then white playing these moves, which are pretty meaningless, um, especially the second one. Just a way to get this forcing move in. And there's no real loss in the whole exchange. So it's not mm -hmm. as if white's losing anything. And it's a correct end game sequence. I, I actually did check the whole end game sequence here. No game losing moves. This move is surprisingly big. We'll see how that works. When white plays here, Okay, yeah. So yeah, this is a big move. It's going to eventually force Black to put a stone in here. Mm -hmm. And this is also a big move where Black gets to squeeze White and is going to get an extra point here. And so the game is close to the end. Um, here, if White had, if Black had played away, it would be very simple. But White would just cut here and cut here and it's already dead. Oh, that is very clever. Wow. Oh, yeah, that was forced. And we're at the end of the game here. Um, White's going to lose the call. In fact, I think they did play two more moves. White's going to lose the call. Yeah, here. And that's it. And wow. Black is ahead wow. by... If we counted it with the Japanese rules, it would be with seven and a half points, it would be half a point for Black. And of course, with the Chinese rules, which are a different system of counting, um, it's the same meaning, but it's, it counts as three-fourths of a stone, which would sort of translate to one and a half points, but it's just the fact that Black fills the, the last uh, dame point, as we, we mm -hmm. call it. And we, Black plays the final move, which gains Black a fraction of a point. It just changed what we would call a half point win for Black to what we would call a one and a half point win for Black. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't change the win-loss result. Right. That's a characteristic uh, of the difference between J Japanese and Chinese rules they rarely change the, the win-loss result. It's just a right. change uh, from one half point. to, And if White had won by half a point, it would still be a half point win for White. Beautiful, beautiful game. Uh, folks, we're going to be wrapping up in a couple of minutes. So if anybody has any you know, last minute questions uh, for Redmond, this would be the time uh, to ask them. But let me just ask you, this is, I mean, and we're, I think just two games uh, uh, from You're wrapping, making yeah. from making the end of this is uh, this, this entire uh, AlphaGo, AlphaGo. Um, so then it's the end of the year. So just uh, wondering about reflections, you know, we've How been, many years was it? It was several years, hasn't it been? It has. It has. Yeah. I'll have to go back and check. More than but... five years, I believe. Um, well, you know, when I started this whole series, even when I was looking um, at the Master series, mm -hmm. even at that series where Master, well, Alpha Roll was playing uh, human players on the net, it looked so alien. Um, and then when we started looking at Alpha Go Zero, uh, Master was looking familiar. And um, so that Master was actually, um, it was an earlier version, obviously. It was a different, actually a completely different version. It was uh, the strongest, um, the strongest version you might say of what evolved from um, the earliest AlphaGo. It was kind of evolution of the Alpha, original AlphaGo program. And then AlphaGo Zero was built without human um, values at all. Right. And so it was a completely different thing. And AlphaGo looked so, so alien to me. 
And it was so difficult to even understand what it was trying to do. And I kept trying to find mistakes because these moves kept looking so wrong to me and different and strange. And I, I seem to have gotten over it. Um, I mean, AlphaGo suddenly, AlphaGo Zero looks, it's something that I can recognize now just because part of it is that everyone is using similar systems. And also because in general, professional players have a much better understanding of um, what's going on with these moves. Mm -hmm. And personally, also myself, I think I have a better understanding of what the ideas that uh, human players would have when playing these moves. Uh, um, I can't really say for AlphaGo what it's thinking. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Um, why would I play such a move? I, I, I'm starting to have better ideas I, uh, about why I would play these moves that AlphaGo is playing. And it makes it look a lot more familiar to me. Um, looks like a normal game, which is, mm -hmm. um, I, I can still remember how alien it was at right. first. And so it's, that's, that's the big take for me is that, um, how did that happen? Like it's, um, it's changed my game a great deal. And, and I'm one of the more stubborn players who has what you might call old fastened values. I, I resist this kind of change, which um, in some cases, just contradicts some of the things we sort of held holy in the game. And it's changed the way we've played, we, we play the openings. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it gives bad scores to openings that we have held very dear to ourselves. And so uh, that was a big issue for me, um, just because I became a strong player using what might be called the old system. So, mm -hmm. it's, and, and it's also difficult for me to adjust because the younger players are much quicker to pick up on these new ideas. So it's, it's relatively difficult. And there's a related question. Uh, Lunestris is wondering if, if your thoughts about the differences between, you know, AlphaGo, Katago, Leela, you know, the different, the different AIs. You know, I know that you often use several different ones when you're doing analysis, right? Um, well, um, the two AIs that we have a lot of access to in that we can put them into our own PCs and use them are uh, Leela and Katago. Um, I tend to use Katago most because it does give um, it does give the count of territory. So it can give you the count of territory as well as points. And I, I have a lot of fun comparing the point scores, which are, you might say they're the, um, the, the percentage of games that Katago won by playing against itself. Um, and so it's a kind of a, um, a percentage, a winning percentage, you might say, um, in a way. I'm, I'm sure a computer engineer would have a, a better way of saying that. Mm. Um, but, um, that score, which was always so difficult for us to understand, for me to understand, for most professionals, the score that is given, it could be a half point difference. Towards the end of the game, the computer is going to give you 90% win percentage. Um, so it's going to give you a score of 90 for the winning side in a half point game if the game is close enough to the end. Um, whereas um, the same difference will be something like 60, 70 score earlier in the game. And it's just because the computer, the program is more, you might say it's more sure of its projection of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes sense, but it's something that was relatively difficult for us to understand because we couldn't really um, make a correlation between the score given and what we expect the result to be in points, in territory. And so that was the difficult thing. And the fact that Katago can give us both, it makes it a lot of fun to make those, um, to see how that changes and how in some cases the scores seems to be relatively close. In some cases, it's um, a, a big difference. And the stronger your um, software is and also the stronger your computer is, the bigger score it's gonna give you, I believe, mm -hmm. um, because it's gonna be more sure of its results. And so if you look at some of the Chinese programs, which are probably stronger than the Katawa I have on my computer, they will give you higher scores because they're, um, and fairly early in the game, because they're stronger, basically. They, they have a more solid um, projection of the future of that game. Gotcha. And so it's interesting to see that difference and how, how the score of the game as we would see it in points of territory um, sort of works with that score that the computer is giving. 
Mm-hmm. One, one, one final question from our, our viewers, uh, wondering whether you think there's been much success uh, integrating traditional Go theory uh, with revelations from, from AI or are people do, trying to do that or are they just going, you know, following AI, <laughs> discarding uh, all I'm the old stuff? I'm probably the only person that's going to try to make that work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm doing some videos, like I did did a video or so on the San Jose. Um, so I'm I'm trying to f- find variants of that, um, these traditional joseki openings, um, fuseki that is. So traditional openings that are not played very much anymore. I like to try to find variants of that that are close enough to even for the AI in a way that would... Um, so I'm trying to find an opening that is traditional and it's going to be um, the future of the game is going to be um, intuitively easy for humans to play. For so, it, so for people who are used to playing San and say, I, I tried to find a variant of the San and say that would be close enough to that, but would also get a relatively good score. So it doesn't have to be 50 50. It can be a slight disadvantage if you're playing a game that you like to play. So that's how I, um, in my own games, I don't really worry about the score that much. Mm-hmm. if I'm playing a game that I like to play. So I can be a few points down. We all know that um, even top players in the world will lose tens of points in the score um, with just one move. In fact, in radical examples, um, I've seen uh, world champion class players lose something like 80 points in the win-loss <laughs> um, projection mark in just one move. Just one misreading, like right, 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 right. The game between Iyama and Shinjinso was pretty. There was just one oversight there, and it turned a one game into a lost game. And I, I don't have an exact number for the score change, but it was pretty big. I'm sure. Wow, wow. Uh, well, listen, lots, uh, lots more to talk about. Uh, we are going to wrap up now, <laughs> though. But uh, of course, uh, thanks to all of you for watching. Appreciate mm-hmm. your sharing some of your Friday night with us. Uh, keep a uh, couple of things you're going to want to do. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already, so that when we uh, do our next commentary, you'll be notified. Uh, you are also going to want to subscribe and help Michael uh, get to his 20,000. Make my prediction yeah. come true. Yeah. And 20, I probably 000. will be doing. I probably will be doing a live broadcast uh, two days from now. So the coming Monday for me, it's going to be a Sunday for most people in the United States. I'll be there. Um, I, I'm going to watch that. Night. I want to see that. Um, because I, yeah. I, I, um, okay, I'll make the promise. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> All right. You've heard so, it here yeah. first, folks. You've heard um, it yeah. here, folks. So, so that's a reason for people to subscribe to my channel, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. Well, as, as if hope. you needed any reason to subscribe to Michael Redmond's channel. Come on now. But, but, but yeah, so now, <laughs> now all of you here have been the first to hear that he's doing. Uh, do you want to? Uh, tease that game a little bit that's is that the that's oh the yeah well it's um like it's a 150 move victory for yama uh-huh. against one of the top players in the world that's shin minjun and like when you talk about korean players you talk about the two shins there's two of them there's shin jinso and there's shin minjun right. right and um so he's like um you could say he's the second strongest player in the world because the koreans have been dominating a little bit um uh, and uh, so it was a big win for yama and 151 moves, very spectacular. Um, but it's oh. really interesting because it was a masterpiece for Shin Minjun, up to a point. <laughs> it, it was Shin Minjun's ma- masterpiece. <laughs> they stuck his finger in his masterpiece. Right, and then something happened. And so that was, oh. the, that was the point. Like it was, you might think it was uh, Yama's spectacular win, but it was actually going to be uh, she means you spectacular. Oh, I can't wait. This is great. All right. So fo- folks, so hop on over to uh, Michael's channel. Hopefully even these put the link in there. Uh, subscribe to Michael's channel because he's got lots of other great stuff. And then uh, we'll see everybody there over there uh, in a couple of nights. And, um, and, and of course, thanks as always to our fabulous producer, Eva D uh, for getting us all to you around the world. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll see you all again soon, but everybody continue to stay safe out there, uh, except on the go board. You can do whatever you want on the go board. It's all good. So thanks again for watching. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Fabulous commentary, fabulous game. Appreciate it. Stay safe. Take care folks.